Thank you, Peter. So next, I want to bring out somebody who also has uh, economic training, um, but who has dedicated most of his life towards a, a very different fight for the title and the rights of uh, the Haida Nation. So please join me in welcoming Miles Richardson for an Indigenous perspective on economics and growth. Oh, uh, thank you, Kai, to Peter and David. I am Kilsly Kaji Sting, Miles Richardson. I'm from the Eagles of Joth of the Haida Nation. That's our village on the west coast of Haida Gwaii. First, I want to acknowledge the Musqueam people and the great Coast Salish nation in whose territory we're gathered tonight. And I want to thank them for again welcoming us as they so generously do in such a, a good way and with, and with such good intentions. I know I, for one, have, have, are very thankful for that, and they've always treated us that way. As we, as we go through this evening, I want you to keep thinking about them and those young dancers and singers that you saw here tonight. And I want, I want you to ask yourselves one question, and I really want you to keep this in your mind and have a serious conversation with yourself about it. Is this nation, the Musqueam of the Coast Salish nation, why can they stand before you today after hundreds of generations and thousands of years of their people living in this place? How can they stand before you and welcome you in such a good way? Why is it that they even exist today? And I say that there's similar stories throughout Canada and around the world of indigenous people. I come from the Haida Nation, 500 miles to the north as the crow flies. Our people have been there since our creation on this earth. That, you know, the latest CO2 dating was 15,000 years back. Imagine that. 7,500 years ago, the ice started receding, the glaciers. You know, just like the Musqueam people, our children today sing a song acknowledging the first tree, a pine tree on Haida Gwaii. I just came back from the Missapostic Cree in northern Manitoba, who, who gave David a name recently. The same situation. They tell me they've been there since the beginning of time for them, and that they've always been in their place and always will be in their place. And it's the same story for indigenous people around the world. Why is that, I want you to ask yourself. Is it a coincidence? Is it an accident of nature? Is it a gift from a benevolent God, some aberration? Or is there some reason for it? My simple message to you tonight is that there's a reason for it. Is those people, each of those peoples, have striven to understand the reality of their place in the world, in the world as they saw it. They understood and accepted that they're just human beings, that they're not the creator. They're not a power anything more than what they are, and that if they were to survive and if they were to prosper, they needed to understand the laws of the world in which they lived and to honor them. And they developed a culture to do that, each of them, in their own way. A culture that incorporated values. And the challenge of their societies became to live those values. 
And that's why they're still here today, I would say. I don't know if any of you want that for us, you know, for the beginnings of what's Canadian society, what, 150 years old, if we want to have a similar experience. But if we do, we'd better pick up our socks. We'd better figure something out here and have a little bit of humility. And I'll tell you, e economists, <laughs> economists aren't the boogeymen. David and I have, have a light jostling about that all the time. I went to, I, I, I never even left Haida Gwaii until I went to school. And I was lucky enough to go to the University of Victoria and get a Bachelor of Arts in economics. And that was a wonderful time for me, learning these different ways of thinking, different ways of paring things down and analyzing them. And, and you know, I mean, it, I mean, economics is just the society, the, the, this is what they told me anyway. It's just the study of um, how individuals and societies make choices amongst um, on how they allocate scarce resources. And the science is modeling and building up different, heavy on the assumptions, <laughs> building up different parameters, isolating different parameters of how decisions affect different aspects of life. You know, if you want full employment, how does the bank levels affect that? But you know, all, you know, all that stuff. I don't know why everybody's so fired up about economics, economists. We got to put them in context is what I'm saying. Anyway, when I got home, I started getting my economics education. I was a young man and I, I got elected to be the president of my nation. I wasn't even 30 years old yet, but I had this economics degree. My people figured I knew something. So I came home and our negotiators then were doing lists of all the trees they've taken off Haida Gwaii, all the fish they've taken, all the minerals they've taken over the years, presumably to send a bill to Canada and say, pay us for what you've wrongfully taken. But things were getting really intense when I came along. The forests, they were threatening to cut the last tree, they were threatening to catch the last fish, ripping minerals out of the ground, and now, just as I got there, they were threatening to drill for oil and gas out in our oceans, which is our, what we live off. And our elders really had to dig deep. I didn't get this stuff, they did. And as we were strategizing around the, protecting our forests and facing this hungry monster of oil drilling, our elders dug deep and basically said, you know, Let's ask ourselves why we're here. Every generation of our nation for thousands of years has met one basic test. They've survived and passed our culture on to the next generation. We're not sure we're going to do that if they drill for this oil. We've got to do something, and let's keep in mind that we're not here as the Haida Nation because of checks from Ottawa and Victoria. Let's, uh, let's understand why we're here. We're here because of the richness of our life source, Haida Gwaii, our gift from the Creator, our responsibility that comes with that gift. If we're going to make it, we'd better look after her. And that became our mandate. That became the mandate for the leadership of the Haida Nation. And so... We sat down and we drew up plans. We did land use plan. I always call it the six-point plan. We said, You're, we're going to protect these areas, no logging. We're going to have um, um, logging here. You're going to change the rules. We had a settlement corridor. Intertidal zone was important to us. We designated that as a management zone, the offshore and fisheries. People laughed at us when we did that. You know, in 2010, fast forward to 2010, this was 30 years later. Gujao is our president now. 
We signed an agreement with BC, not putting into provincial legislation that exact, well, a better plan. There was more conservation than we drew up 30 years ago. But not one tree over that line, not one area was left out. So that was wise, what our elders told us. That was an economic education that, that um, was profound for me. And it told me is we have to be, in the face of everything in this world, we have to be who we know we are. We have to have the courage to live up and stand up and accept our responsibilities as a living generation of our people. And I would suggest that every living generation of every society has those responsibilities. One experience I had was going with the circle of elders, traditional elders, spiritual leaders from all around North America. They're meeting at the Fourth World Wilderness Congress. And what we were hearing from the likes of James Baker III, um, Bush Seniors, Secretary of the Treasury, bankers like David Rockefeller and Edmund de Rothschild from Britain, really hefty, weighty people in, in the world's governance in those days were in front of the 55 nations who were gathered there saying, we agree, environment is an important consideration, but we're here to tell you that economic growth is absolutely essential. The leaders that I was gathered with, the spiritual leaders from all these nations, get, got together and talked amongst themselves and gave their response in the middle of this conference and said simply that our environment, what you call our environment, our relationship with the rest of creation is life. Economic growth, they said, is a matter of interpretation. It just deepened what my elders had been telling me. And th this group of Amer North American spiritual leaders distills those common understandings amongst these ancient nations and just puts them out to the world, to anybody who wants to listen. It was awesome. And I had hope in the last couple of months when I was reading a very similar message from the Pope of the Catholic Church. You know, when he told, his, when he told the Americans, he said, you know, we've been interpreting the scriptures wrong. This is what I heard him say. He said, we've interpreted that a righteous life has two fundamental relationships. Man and his creator, and man and his neighbor. He said, we've left one very important relationship out. And he said, let's not beat ourselves, let's just fix it. He said, the other fundamental relationship in a righteous life is between man and the rest of creation. That's exactly what my elders told me. That's what, you know, it, so it gives me hope. I don't, um, you know, I, we got to do something. We got to act soon. You know, did all the, you hear all the indicators. David has laid it out eloquently and many people here, but we have to act soon and we have to be who we say we are. You know, if Canadians lived up to the rule of law, we wouldn't have an Aboriginal title issue in this country. It's the denial of, of the existence of indigenous people. It's the denial of our fundamental human rights that causes problems. Inconsistent and is hypocritical with Canadian law because it's there in black and white. Same with climate change. The denial of, of the irrefutable science, the denial so you can keep polluting is the same problem. We gotta wake up, we gotta demand accountability from our leaders. And I believe there's two things we can do. Okay, Kai, I'm closing. <laughs> I believe there's two things we can do. One, a very, I'm very excited about the, the um, right to a healthy environment campaign that the Blue Dot 
tour, the David Suzuki Foundation has been promoting. Um, if, if we respect our relationship with the rest of creation, let's accept that that's the status quo. That clean air, clean water, and clean soil is our starting point. And that we as a society value that enough to protect it. And if somebody is going to come in and make a buck off that, they've got to prove to us, not the other way around. They've got to prove to us that they're not going to harm it unacceptably. Achieving that objective is a beginning, and it'll be our measure of our commitment as, as responsible human beings. And I'm very excited for that. The second one is this election that's coming up on the 19th, and I don't have to worry about anybody cutting off my funding, but let, let's... Um, <laughs> there's... The biggest part about global... Warming is the deniers. You know, if, if, we under, if we accept that there's a problem, and there is a problem, there's ways we can deal with this. There's ways that we as a human species can, can mitigate that problem, but we gotta get on with it. We gotta keep those deniers accountable. You know, quit sending just sniveling politicians to office. Send leaders who stand for something. Send leaders who stand up for the values that bind us as a society and will stand up and fight for those in the face of money or in the face of any of those challenges. You know, in this election coming up on the 19th, there's a couple of options out there to do it. Don't let those same old guys continue to do what they're doing. Our lives depend on it. You know, we're, in, we're collectively in as tough a situation as the Haida Nation was 30 years ago. I know we can do it, so we have lots of time to talk. Thank you very much for listening to me. How are?